Kia ora koutou. So much like the name of this conference, understanding disaster risk is one of the key priorities of the Sendai framework. So we need to understand disaster risk in all its dimensions, and this can be used for pre-disaster risk assessment, for prevention mitigation, and also post-event response as well. And the Sendai framework states that one of the ways that we can do this is by enhancing and developing our tools to model and quantify disaster risk. And so that's, like Julian said, that's the theme of the session today. So when we're undertaking a risk assessment, whether it's for natural hazards or, or other phenomena, there's a spectrum of different approaches. And these range from qualitative approaches, which are usually expert-driven, through to more complex data-driven methods. So Gary and I today are going to present on two tools or two models that are used in New Zealand, that have been developed in New Zealand and are used in the Asia-Pacific region, Riskscape and Merit, and go through how these can be used for, for risk management. So Riskscape is the first tool we're going to talk about, and Riskscape is some software that provides a risk analysis framework for natural hazards. And what it can do is it can quantify the impact on our communities in terms of impact on people, so injuries and deaths, on buildings, the damage and financial uh, cost of repairing those, on our infrastructure, so how long will it take for our infrastructure to be operational again, and what will the uh, repair cost be, and also an um, impact on the environment, such as agriculture and horticulture. Riskape, the Riskape project has four key uh, partners. So GNS and Niwa uh, started the project around 10 years ago. Recently, uh, Toko Toake EQC have come on board as a partner. And we developed the software through Catalyst IT, which is an open source software developing firm based in Wellington here. Now, the key strategic outcomes for the Riskate project is to ensure that New Zealand is more resilient to natural hazards by making risk information readily accessible and uh, people can undertake risk assessments. And we do this through developing tools through our software that people can use to quantify disaster risk and then make informed disaster risk management decisions. The Riskscape tool has been developed with users in mind. So we've run a series of workshops across New Zealand, mostly in 2018, 2019, where we sought user requirements for such a tool. And this ranged from uh, all across different sectors, from insurance to local government, central government, infrastructure lifeline companies, and researchers as well. And based on this, we developed a series of personas that typical, uh, that basically define the requirements for those types of people. And then we've built the software with those personas in mind. So based on that uh, feedback we got from uh, potential end users, is we designed a system that supports risk-based decision-making that allows people to quantify the impacts uh, as is, and also with mitigation options so that benefit can be quantified. The system's flexible. So it can uh, meet the needs of researchers who want custom workflows and risk analysis methods, and it can be tailored for uh, different end user sectors as well. The software is fast, it runs in minutes usually for most calculations, and we can calculate impacts on a national scale in the, a matter of minutes as well. We can model the impacts at single uh, buildings or at aggregated national scales. And then we have different ways that we can deliver the software through uh, the Riskscape engine, which I'll talk about in a moment, which is targeted for researchers, and the Riskscape platform, which is an online solution for, uh, for other applications as well. We can also model uh, any type of hazard and different types of exposure and assets as well. So the key components of uh, the Riskscape tool is the engine. So you can think of this as being the calculator. So this basically is the workflow where you design and you undertake your risk analysis. And to run the engine, you need some information. So you need a Riskscape project, which contains hazard data, which could be flood maps or earthquake shaking maps, or it could be uh, wind fields from a tropical cyclone. And then you need some information on what's at risk. So that's our asset data, which could be building locations, could be a, a, a water network. And then we combine that with a risk function, which essentially says, given those assets and those, that hazard, what's the consequence going to be? And this usually comes from our, from our risk science community. 
The pipeline essentially instructs the engine how to do things, and researchers can use this through a command line interface. And the RiskScape engine itself is open source, so people can download that from the, the RiskScape website. Now, not everyone wants to interact through a command line interface, which is that kind of uh, terminal that you might see on coding in movies. So we've got what we call the RiskScape platform, which is a web-based solution that's hosted in the cloud where uh, people can build projects and run models uh, and access data from different data sources as well. And they then interact with the platform through a graphical user interface, through a, a normal web browser shown at the top. And on top of it, you can also design custom interfaces for different users. Uh, there's programming interfaces as well, which means that people can actually uh, build in the Riscape uh, model into their external systems as well. So you don't need to run it by yourself, you can bring that into, bring to, in that into ex, um, existing applications. So how do we actually undertake this analysis? So the keys here are bringing in those different data and do, doing some spatial sampling, and then we can analyze the consequences and report the outputs in different types of formats and for different needs. Getting a bit more detailed for those who want uh, to know the sort of the nitty gritty, there's a whole lot of different geoprocessing, spatial sampling, and consequence analysis techniques that can be drawn on. So these you could think of being as different tools in the toolbox that a user can put them together into a workflow for what they need to do. So this could meet the needs of lots of different users. Now key to uh, what we've done is we've uh, got really enhanced geoprocessing techniques. And why this is important is that when we're looking at hazards of different scales, which could be a flood at a metre resolution at individual buildings or an earthquake that affects the whole country, we need different ways to be able to process that data. And so we've got a, a large toolbox of geoprocessing techniques that allow us to model uh, realistically the exposure onto different hazards across the country. So I'm going to go through now a few case studies of how RiskScape's been used in Aotearoa, New Zealand and the Pacific. Uh, and show how it can be used to inform decision on risk management techniques. So Togatuake EQC uh, has a version of Riscape that yet they use internally for their loss modeling. So they use this for three different uh, cases. One is post-event loss assessment. So they use Riscape combined with shape maps from GeoNet to inform the potential numbers of claims in the minutes following an event. They also use uh, RiskScape for scenario modeling. So what if a Wellington Fault earthquake happened or a subduction zone earthquake? How many claims would there be? Where would they be located? And this can be used for response planning. They also use what we call a probabilistic model, which estimates uh, all possible earthquakes over a future time period. And this is used to inform their reinsurance uh, decision making and how much reinsurance they will get every year. Recently, we've used Riscape uh, to deploy uh, an earthquake and a, a tropical cyclone model for the Pacific Catastrophe Risk Insurance Company, which offers uh, insurance to South Pacific countries. And Riscape was used to develop a new platform where they could build a custom interface on top of that to allow visualization of risk. And so this example here shows the estimates of risk for Papua New Guinea uh, for the different regions. And this information is used for helping South Pacific countries develop insurance at a national level following events. Through the National Science Challenge, the Deep South, Challenge, the Deep South uh, National Science Challenge, RiskScape was used to estimate the infrastructure exposure to sea level rise. So the national networks of road, uh, electricity, airports, uh, rail networks were used to uh, overlay with potential sea level rise scenarios. And this was used to quantify the number of exposures uh, in terms of the infrastructure networks to different sea level rise scenarios to show where the greatest risk is. And this type of analysis can be used as the first step through to more detailed risk assessment uh, once you can focus in on different areas, so a screening exercise. Uh, a few years ago, uh, the RiskScape project worked with the Queenstown Lakes District Council to help uh, develop uh, risk information to inform land use policy. So there's a large alluvial flat, uh, fan uh, uh, in Queenstown where there's the potential risk for rockfalls and debris flow. 
and the Queenstown Lake District Council wanted to have information on what the potential future risk might be. And so we developed a future exposure uh, for uh, 2100, so where buildings might be under different development policy options. We could then quantify the risk for those policy options and see what the benefit was of certain mitigation measures. And then this was used to present back to the council and the community to develop an appropriate uh, land use policy decision for that area. Uh, NIWA worked with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment and uh, RPS Samoa, where Riskate was integrated into a flood decision-making system. So in this case, Riskate was used to estimate the uh, impacts in real time for floods uh, occurring in this river that runs through the centre of Apia. And so uh, by having rapid uh, estimates of impacts, the emergency managers could make decisions on evacuation uh, before the, the flood actually reached the community. And finally, this links into what Gary's going to talk about. Uh, back in 2017, uh, Riskate was used uh, it is through in a project called the Wellington Resilience Project, where the lifeline companies in, in Wellington wanted to quantify the benefit of investing in resilience uh, measures. And so Riskape and Merit were used to estimate the damage and recovery for 10 different lifeline networks across, across the Wellington region for both uh, low spending and high spending investment uh, cases. And this could be used then to quantify what's the benefit in terms of uh, access to service for lifelines following a large Wellington earthquake, as well as the economic benefit as well to the, uh, to the region and nationally, if that investment occurred. And this was used as a business case for Treasury to try to get investment going in, in, in lifeline resilience in the Wellington region. So if you're interested in uh, learning more about Riskate, please visit the website or, or feel free to email me. You can download the engine and have a, have a little bit of a play with it and, and also access the community forum to ask questions uh, amongst other, other users of Riskate. Uh, thank you very much. Go to. I'm not sure if it comes up straight away. Hi there, do you start up back there, do you? Okay, thank you. Well, anyway, as we're getting started, I'll just introduce myself. So, uh, tēnā koutou katoa, nā mihi ki te atua, nā mihi ki te ora, te hei Māori ora. Uh, ko Gary MacDonald, tōku ingoa, um, nā mihi nui, nā mihi aroha, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. So, just a warm welcome from everyone from me and also from Nick in that process. So um, I'm going to be talking about um, helping communities understand socioeconomic impacts of consequences of disruption events. And um, the, the, the bridge between myself and Nick is I'm more about disruption and less about the asset losses through the process. So um, here's some big numbers. And often when we see when we have a, um, a hazard event or a natural hazard um, event, we, we see these big numbers consistently through... Um, our work, we see $1.7 trillion there of damages of goods. This is between 2000 and 2012. Um, 2.9 billion uh, people affected and 1.2 million people killed. Um, and I often look at these big numbers and I think, well, well, what does it mean? And, and, and so what? Where does this go? And actually, when we just look at the asset losses and we look at asset losses directly, yeah, that tells us a lot about what we might face with the infrastructure that we've affected, with the buildings that we have. But actually, there's a lot of impacts that actually happen after that event, and that's what I'm interested in. I'm really interested in what are we going to do with the disruption that goes on from that. And just to put that in context, as you will know that we had an earthquake back in 2000 or a couple of earthquakes, um, called the Canterbury earthquakes, back in 2010, 2011, and we're still working through the process of resolving some of the claims associated with those. So I would argue that the impacts that were felt on the housing alone, in terms of loss of assets, were only part of it. Actually, for a lot of people involved, that's been 10 years of pretty hard grind going through that. So I think part of the equation is to look beyond just what we see with the asset components. Um, and here's a good example of it. Here's a situation where we've got a, um, a lake system. This is actually in the Waitakere Ranges in Auckland. Um, and this is what we had just over a year ago with a lot of disruption in Auckland caused by a lack of water um, uh, being able to be provided. And what we had is low lake le and low water levels in the dams and the Waitakere Ranges providing for the communities. Um, but there were no 
financial losses associated with that directly. No assets were destroyed, no people were affected in it, but the economic consequences were quite significant, particularly to those, um, to those um, groups that required considerable amounts of water. But it's not just as simple as that. We can go a little bit further and we can start to say, well, if we're just looking at the basis of looking at assets, um, an eroding outage, what happens is that the actual eroding outage itself might actually not cost very much to repair the physical damages of it might be quite small, but actually what is transported along that road segment can be actually really significant. So, you know, the freight, the passengers, the people movements, and particularly if it's to a community that then becomes isolated, they lose that ability to be able to connect. So we, we think that's that's another example of it. And of course, another one from New Zealand, which is um, what we happened at the Wirree Pipeline. There's a pipeline that goes from Marsden Point in the northern part of New Zealand through to, um, through to Auckland and provides fuel um, basically for aviation, but also for other purposes as well. And we had a break in that pipeline, um, actually caused by a, a, someone with a digger actually just digging through it by accident. Um, the problem with that was that it caused significant disruption in our actual um, aviation sector for a number of times. And in fact, it's led, and for those who are aware, there was a report, um, a Board of Inquiry and Commission into that, and it's led to actually some bunkering of fuels within other parts. So what we can see is that these disruption effects um, can, can be quite significant at a small scale, but they can also be really large when you take it another step, and this step is the coronavirus, and we didn't have any physical damages to buildings or to, to infrastructure. We did have a substantial loss of life, but what we did have also was significant disruption impacts. In fact, we are still seeing those disruption impacts pay out right now. Um, the other bit that I really would want you to, to think about is I'm often asked as an economist what um, economic, what is the economic impact of a particular event? And like all economists, I just say, um, well, it depends on a whole lot of things. <laughs> um, but um, one of the key things that really depends on is the duration that you look at. So I'd like to think, get people thinking across time and over long, longer periods of time, because these disruption impacts just don't pay out immediately from an event. They pay out in recovery, they play out, play out in uh, rebuild that we may have with it. Um, and they play out in displacement. And that's actually shown in the, the global coronavirus um, you know, chart there where we've got a big drop associated and then a recovery period. So really what the, what the consequences are depends on when you look at it and it also depends on what phase you're in in the process. But one thing that's really certain about all of this, the quicker that we can adopt technologies and options to recover, the less the impact will be felt immediately after it. So it's all about creating uh, faster and speedier recovery. So what is Merit? Well, Merit basically looks at disruption consequences. Um, it does this across space. Um, it looks at communities, districts, regions in the national scale. Um, and it also does this through time. And it can do it for up to, up to 100 years at, at low resolutions. At high resolutions, it can do it pretty much across up to about 20 years into the future. So it can track us through not just the response phase of events, but also through recovery phases of, expense, mm -hmm. of events. I mean, that's really important because there's some really interesting ways of telling the story to communities through transition, how you transition through it, giving people hope. If we just look at the endpoints, often we tell them the story of those big numbers, and the big numbers, you know, they're meaningless unless you understand the context in which they've occurred. So, um, but it also does it for multiple um, stakeholders, and I think that's important. It does it across industries, it does it for different types of households, and it also does it for different infrastructure providers, government, uh, not-for-profit organisations, and also for our Indigenous people here in New Zealand, for iwi. So, um, but the good thing about it is <laughs> um, it can do this with and without options for mitigation and um, adaptation built in. So what we can do is we can put forward a case for look, what happens if we actually harden our infrastructure? What happens if we actually go and work with communities and we look at how we may adapt going through time um, to, to an event? We, we put in place processes for them to be able to do that. We can check, we can test that, and we can also do it through the process of cascading and coincident hazards, and this is really important. We are in a world of change. We're in this position where we are gonna have a very disrupted future over the next 20 to 50 years with climate change, with a whole lot of geopolitical problems, with aging populations globally, a whole lot of megatrends that exist out here that are emergent. 
We've got those, but at the same time, we're likely to have large-scale hazard events, and we're also going to have these running simultaneously. So the question is, it's a very different world in the future, more disruptive world, than we have now. So we need to be able to model these things simultaneously for a whole range of things. So um, a key part of this process is it's very multi-hazard in the process, and we can deal with different types of eruptions. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the technical detail at all. I don't want to bore you too much, but I will give you a little bit of an insight of where we came from and, and, and where we've gone um, to with that. So we started with the idea, well, what type of models were out there that we could actually um, draw on to help us understand what consequences might be in the wider economy, these wider economic impacts. And we, the, the common one that's used right across the entire world, in fact, is called computable general equilibrium. It's a type of modelling that basically tries to um, solve, you, you can put into a shock and then you can run it through and you can have a look and it tries to equilibrate prices for supply and demand and tries to marry everything up and, and show you what the new economy will look like in the future. It's actually pretty good at doing that, um, but the problem with it is it doesn't tell us much about transition paths. It just tells us the beginning and the end. Also, when we really reviewed this, we began to realise that it had some major faults for the context in New Zealand where we've been applying it, and its major fault was that it couldn't tell us anything about out-of-equilibrium dynamics. Actually, when you have a major event, equilibrium ceases to exist. Supply prices and demand prices for commodities, for labour, for, for capital, all change quite dramatically within an economy. So we wanted a model that could track it at smaller resolutions and time steps than just an average that had assumed that equilibrium had been reached. So we did a lot of development in doing that and built um, and, and, and a globally leading piece of development looking at our outer equilibrium dynamics, building a model that was more appropriate for looking at um, disruption. Um, but we also realised that we needed to have... Um, a human factor to it. We started to move away from just saying, well, look, here's an economic modelling capacity. Actually, what are we really modelling? Well, we're modelling about people and the change in their behaviours. So what we wanted to do is have a system built into it that could allow us to bring adaptation by businesses and also by communities into the modelling process. So we kept the economic model, but we attached to it a functionality, what we call the business behaviours model, which allows us to connect these processes all up. And um, we did that by working with um, the risk, risk people in terms of looking at infrastructure connections to it. So we went a step further. We connected businesses to infrastructure, connected that up, and we also did that uh, with communities in their networks as well. So we started to get a much more end-to-end -end perspective from hazard, what I would call the hazard to wellbeing chain. Um, where have we applied it? Um, like Nick, we've applied it in many, many, many small scale type of events like road outages. In fact, NZTA have a tool that we've developed that we, Waka uh, Kotahi, have this tool that we've developed that we can run online to look at what an outage of particular roads and that simultaneously right across the country you can put a whole lot of roads in and you can put group roads in and you can work out what the, the economic impacts associated with that would be. Um, so we have it there, and we've done that for water, uh, for water resources and also for electricity resources and working with different um, groups out there. But actually where we've really ended up in more recent times is looking at um, multi-hazard events. So what we've got here um, in the, the, your, your top left-hand corner there, which is um, the Kaikoura earthquake, where we actually looked at multiple infrastructures through the economy and, and, and through time and duration. We've also used it and we're using it in our research projects. Um, uh, one that we're using it to look at how do we transition to big scale impacts. Uh, we're doing with Taranaki um, there. Um, and also we've got some other projects looking in the climate change um, area as well as it develops. And in Auckland, looking at coastal inundation. Now there's a whole research team under this, close to 30 to 40 people who are underpinning um, that development. And we've also done it with Alpine, uh, Alpine Fault as well. Um, I'm going to just go through one case study and just take you through that so I can show you how we actually have applied it. But I want to talk about this case study in light of how can we really make change and create resilience in our communities. Um, in New Zealand, we have a framework called the Better Business Case Framework. That framework is based around cost-benefit analysis, and we use it to evaluate all of our investment decisions, big investment decisions, and we go through that. So we did that with the Wellington Resilience Program, and we built a business case to look at infrastructure um, improvements across a whole range of infrastructures um, to look at it. 
But it's a little bit different because one of the processes that we wanted to do, both with Riscape and with Merit, was move people away from just thinking about costs and benefits to starting to talk about resilience, costs and benefits that are that are um, co-benefits. We wanted to make sure the co-benefits were being accounted for because normally economic efficiency rules out over the resilience investments. So we wanted to move that. But as we went through that, we realised that actually the changes that we want to create are more around cost-effective analysis. We know we have to change because it's, um, uh, it's a, we have a high vulnerability to earthquakes in this particular area. Uh, we, we know we need to do investments. It then becomes about, well, how, can, how will the impacts change by the investments we put in? So we started to move the cost-benefit um, framework more towards looking at impact-based investing. What are the outcomes if we do these impacts and using that to sell our cost benefit? It's a very different way of looking at um, the economic system. So I'll just rattle through quickly the, the program itself. So it was a magnitude 7.5 uh, earthquake uh, within the Wellington region. It was run with, uh, I think there were 18 um, infrastructure providers that were present, and that includes all lifelines infrastructure, electricity, water, um, gas, road systems, transport, it included air transport, it included a ferry, ferry crossings across our two islands in New Zealand, um, and a whole range of other infrastructures as well, all interconnected, all people from all of those organisations in the room trying to work together, looking at their asset investments, with the question of how can we create more resilience quickly within the system, given we know we might face one of these earthquake events. So how do we actually use uh, Merit in the process? Well, it's a stepwise process, I'm not going to go through all of it, but I'll just say we start with the asset losses and the capital asset losses when we have the physical damage, that does flow on and there's a lot of disruption associated with those capital losses. And if it was in a system where there was no earthquake insurance beyond it, that would even be more major because there, was no, there would be no money coming in to actually solve that. So it is really important understanding the asset components and the losses there. Um, we, we then look at well, what happens with land and with buildings through Riscape, um, and also what happens with wider infrastructures. And in fact, we just don't look at the infrastructures in isolation, we look at them as interconnected systems, so basically a system of systems with all infrastructure brought together in that. So we spend a lot of time working through what that would mean. Um, and then we move into well, what does that mean for businesses, and what we've done through various surveying processes have looked at how businesses who might be infrastructure by, who might be affected by infrastructure losses would respond. So we had some operability functions, very similar to the functions that Nick talked about, that says, well, look, if we have this type of event, this is the particular type of operability that that business will have, depending on where it is, um, depending on what type of activity it's involved in. But we could look right across the economy in real detail, up to 500 industries looking at the different components. We then also wanted to look at the people component, and this is really important around um, people and business relocations and a whole lot of other factors, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, and then we run it through our, our merit model, which is called the dynamic economic model, and have a look at well, what are the complex consequences holistically across the economy. Not just looking at one region, but importantly looking at another region. And in fact, the person who led this project, Dame Fran Wilde, said to me, look, Gary, we need to demonstrate there are impacts outside of Wellington, that this is going to have impacts for the whole of New Zealand. So we did that. Um, in the process of doing this, we, like I said, we've built with the risk models, and what you can see here is just a little simulation running of the, from it, and this is actually from the event where we were looking at little islands of what would be affected and where it would be affected and the rates of which would things would come back on. And that's really important. Your investment decisions may speed up the way which water and electricity come back on, and that could have a substantial effect on the consequences felt, and particularly if we can do that in an integrated way. Um, I think this is really important, and it talks about the transition of where we've moved to with our work. We've moved away from just looking at the modelling of infrastructures and the modelling of economy to actually saying, actually, the real lens for our work is people. And it came about more about what will happen with people following the events um, um, through it. So we needed to build an interface that incorporated those components into the modelling as well. And we've, we've spent an entire, um, a large amount of time doing that process. 
Um, of course, transport inputs. Um, transport is really important. I just had a separate slide for that. And the, m the main reason for it is because it, independent, it acts as a medium by which we move everything around. It's like fuel. If you don't have it, it's top of your resilience chain. You need fuel to be able to move things. You need transport to be able to do repairs and rebuilds, particularly folding events. So getting a transport system is a key component of that, that change. And there's a whole range of aspects to that that we've looked at, including including freight, passenger transport, um, business operability, and how that affected businesses indirectly. Um, you know what that meant for other parts of the country. So it's not just isolated to the area affected; it's everything that passes through that, and everything that connects. I think this is probably this is a second to last slide. Um, this tells us the story through. And what we've got is a simulation or a run in the event, and you can see the recovery process is kicking in as we went through. And this is by different sectors of the economy. And what we did is we talked to these different sectors and you know, started to encourage them about making change so they could address things. But the real story here is that the investment packages that we had made a substantial change to the rate at which that recovery would occur. Even after two years, and the simulation runs for two years, um, we didn't actually quite, we didn't completely recover through it. We still had a lag effect of some losses associated with that. Um, if that had been with, that was just one single earthquake, uh, maximum likelihood, uh, maximum likely event, but if, but if we'd have had that in um, other disruption happened simultaneously, those effects could have gone on for a lot longer. And that's the world that we're heading to, so I think it's important that we think about it. One of the things, the big thing for me about this project wasn't so much all this modelling. What it was for me was bringing all the infrastructure um, providers together and getting them to look at their asset management plans simultaneously and starting to say, look, I've got some assets on my new assets coming on my register that I'm going to be investing in. Could I bring those forward or could I move them back um, and bring other things forward that would enable someone else in the system to make change? And actually, doing that is probably the greatest way that we can create resilience. It is all about prioritisation and scheduling for mitigations in this particular study. Um, unfortunately, with the way we did it, we looked at 600 different investment options and we put them all on the table simultaneously. That's not how it would play out. How it would play out is there'd be different ones at different times. Um, yep, a range of benefits from it. Um, from it, I think the biggest, the biggest benefit of those, those are all positive benefits that came out of it, and I'd agree with all those. But I think the biggest benefit is we challenged the cost-benefit framework, we moved it from cost-benefit to cost-effectiveness towards impact-based investing, and we wrote that very clear, and we made that very clear in our business case to government. Um, we also were able to show that we could do that end-to-end -end pipeline. All right, Nick working with the models running very quickly. It took us about six months to do all the modelling for this, but having done that, we can now do that in a matter of weeks, and I don't doubt that in a few years we'll be doing that in a matter of days, even minutes. So the architecture has been designed for us to do this end-to-end modelling. Um, future directions, um, distributional impacts. This is from the COVID work. We're also involved in COVID modelling. And we're moving away from just modelling averages and the big numbers um, for those industries to looking at who is vulnerable in the industries and, more importantly, who is it affecting at the household level. So where do we need to target our investments to go for resilience? Not just investing generally. Even our response to COVID was pretty not lame in the sense that we just provided a general work subsidy without any targeting. Some industries needed it more than others. We could have actually used that money better spend across it. So what we're moving here is away from just looking averages to looking at the margins. Um, and the, the final real slide is looking at policy support. Um, and like Nick was showing with the work that they were doing on Riscape, we're also trying to link this to other processes and other models out here that councils and other agencies are using to help create risk in the process. Final slide, um, basically to say um, it's a process. It's not necessarily modelling. Mod um, all modelling is wrong. Um, and some modelling is useful and some of it's actually uh, fit for purpose. <laughs> but the, the reality is it's about the process of understanding all those connections. There is a tremendous amount of learning that goes on with our simulating futures to actually look at what impacts may be. And that's it, Julian, I'll pass back to you.